Okay, welcome to CS224. I'm glad you're still in the course, that you didn't withdraw, you didn't drop. But there's still time. If you want to drop out, there's still time. You have a few more weeks. Uh, the first project, as you know, is off and launched, and hopefully you're active in your groups, you're meeting, you're working out the algorithms that you need, you're understanding how to write in the pseudocode language, which will be the expression of your algorithm. The first checkpoint, we decided not to ask for any MIPS code. So your first checkpoint will be strictly design, and your second checkpoint will be strictly implementation and testing. So we've divided the project in two phases. And of course, this Friday, you will turn in your preliminary design and receive a different group's preliminary design. And on the weekend, you'll need to meet in order to do the design review of that other group's. <coughs> and on Monday, you'll turn in a design review report. Uh, along with that, one copy of the report and the re design you reviewed will go to us for grading. We'll see how good of a job you did in reviewing the design. The other copy will go back to the group that did the design, and they'll get your feedback. And you'll get somebody else's feedback. So it's a system called peer review. Peer review. It's widely used in industry in order to help engineers check their work against their peers. So all of us know some things about um, assembly language coding. All of us know some things about linked list. All of us understand now the 10 utilities. All of us understand the uh, design language, which will be the pseudocode that we've specified. And so all of us can review each other's work. We can review your work. You can review each other's work. So that's what we're going to be doing. So plan time this weekend. Don't go away to your Memliquet. Plan time this weekend to meet with your team. Well, if you go away to your Memliquet, then you cannot sign the report. You're not part of the team. You get a zero on that checkpoint. If you're gone, when your team does the design review, you're still part of the group, but you get a zero. Okay? So you've got to be part of the team. Nobody can miss meetings and still get the credit for the team's work because you're not there. You're not part of the team if you're not at the meetings. Okay? So even if you divided up the 10... Uh, procedures into your team and said, you do these, you do these, you do these. We want your team to be reviewing the other team's design, okay? So everybody's involved in the design review. And then we want to have one report, not four. A staple does not turn four <coughs> reports into one report. A staple just puts some pages together. One report means it has a continuity of style, it has a continuity of usage, it has a continuity of approach. If you take four different people and let them each write a report and put a staple on it, that doesn't count as one report. That'll be very obvious to us that you've done that. So we want you to, what's the Turkish word? Uyum Salamak. Okay, we want you to, between the authors of the sections of your report, bring a unity to it. All right, so that's a task in and of itself, is to, to, to speak with one voice, even though you're a team of four. Okay, so we're expecting these things from you. I'm, I'm very clear, we're expecting these things. If you disappoint us and don't meet our expectations, do not expect to get a good grade, okay? So we're setting the bar high. This is not four people's individual work with a staple on it. This is one team's work. So you need to be meeting with your team. You need to be helping each other, cooperating, listening. What I strongly suggest is review each other's work before you turn it into somebody else on Friday. You have a team of four. So why can't she check your work? Why can't you check his work? All of us understand how to uh, read specifications and write the uh, pseudocode expression for the design. So just because you did count, somebody else did insert, why not review their work? Yeah, that's a good strategy, is internal review before you send it out for external review. Don't be uh, fooled. The external review will be very critical and very harsh. Uh, all the groups understand their job is to find weaknesses. And if they don't find them and we find them, the reviewing team will be given a low grade. So therefore, the, the reviewing team will aggressively and the teaching team will aggressively go through your design to try to find things that are foolish, wrong, misunderstandings, uh, misuses of the uh, pseudocode syntax, et cetera, et cetera. So therefore, try to pitch it at a very high standard so there's nothing to find. Try to make it so there's nothing to find. Kusur siz olsun ki bulunmasın. Herhangi bir eksiklik, tamam mı? Yeah, that's the goal. All right, so I'm setting a very high standard for you. And now I'm asking you to respond by putting in your effort on this. This is one of two major learning activities in this course. The second is project two. And these major learning activities will determine whether you really did anything in this course, whether you got anything that's lasting, whether you made positive steps toward becoming an engineer, or whether you just said, no, I don't want to do it. I don't care. We're in the deal. And you're just sort of a passive student. In that case, I'm not sure that you're really ready to move on to the next course, which is CS. 342 operating systems. So we'll see about how your performance on the projects are. Project percentage of the grade is very high. Project yapmayan gechmez. That's the simple rule. Just basic, you know, if you don't do the projects and participate in them, you'll not do well. 
oh, I'm not planning to do them, Hoja, but I'm going to get on the back of my friends and they're going to carry me across and I'm going to get their project grade, just like I did in CS102. No, not. You're not going to do that. That's going to be prevented in the most diligent way that we can. If you are the lazy one in your group, you're going to get burned. We're going to work very hard to see that you do. So if anybody's trying to ride free on the back of their teammates and not carry their share of the load, you're going to be really sorry. You're going to be fired from your job. Okay, that's what I'm going to do. I'm the boss of this company, and I'm going to fire you. I'm going to kick you out because there's no reason that I should pay your salary if he's doing the work and you're putting your name on it. There's no reason I should do that, and I will not. Okay, you're just load on my company. You're just you, and I don't like you. I want everybody to pull their share of the load. So if you're in a group, Urukumru, and you're not doing your share of the load, then you're not going to get the group's grade. We have a really harsh. Uh, uh, algorithm here. Let me explain how it works just so everybody knows. I'm happy about it. I'm not embarrassed about it at all. I want everybody to know this is how the system works. It's really harsh. Um, group grade multiplied by personal participation factor. You know what the personal participation factor can be? Anywhere from zero up to 100. That means if the group grade is 95 and your personal participation factor is 20%, you're going to get a 19, not a 95. If the group grade is 80 and your personal participation factor is 50, you'll get a 40 instead of an 80. Okay, it's multiplied by it. So what we're estimating, what we're evaluating here is on every checkpoint report, any emails we receive, any questions I ask about group members, any complaints that come out of the group, uh, the reports that you give about what you've done, even the first contact report. If there was a person who was out of contact and didn't get in on that report, their grade cannot be 100 now because they didn't participate in the first design checkpoint, which was to get on the team. Um, the oral exam, uh, the reports you write in the back of the, uh, where we ask for what has everybody done, what meetings have you had, when have they come, all that stuff, all those are part of this personal participation factor. So if you said, oh man, I rode free through CS102, I didn't do anything, and I got a great grade, don't expect the same thing to happen again in this course. Do not expect. And don't expect it to happen in life. I mean, moodurs and team leaders and project managers in companies are very good at sniffing out a bad smell and saying, you're out of here. We don't need you on our team. You're not working. You're gone, lady. I'm sorry. You've been here six months. You're not doing anything for us. You're just sucking mosh. We've got some money. We're going to pay it to somebody who can work. Can you work? Can you work for a company? Can you produce something? Yesterday we had an external advisory board meeting and captains of industry came in, Microsoft Turkey, IBM Turkey, uh, Cybersoft, uh, Aselsan, uh, Havelsan, all the big employers came and they told us once again what they want from our graduates and what they want is the things I'm telling you about. Team player, hard working, initiative, Gira Shimji, on time, early, works, does the job, initiative, creative, um, communicates well, uh, leaderlich, all that kind of stuff, that's what they want. And what they don't want is super ferdelich, laziness, tech passionate, I'll do whatever I want, urunda delim, I don't care about the work rules, this is my life, I'll do what I want, um, you know, kind of goofing off, unproductive. One of the things they said was verim, verim, verim. They're looking for people that can produce output. Can you make something that can make a product and make a company successful? Let's find out here on the first project. Let's find out what you can make, okay? So this is a big pep talk, because I think there's some need for motivation. I've seen already some laziness. I've seen some already some goofing off. I've seen some already some that CS102, I'll ride free attitude. And I'm gonna tell you right now, you're not gonna ride free. This can be a zero, and it's been a zero in years past, and it may be a zero for you if you take the wrong attitude about this. So participation means coming to your group's meetings. Participation means answering the emails of your group members. Participation means calling back on the phone when you see that they called. If I get reports that, you know, Ozer, everybody in his group is saying he doesn't call back, he doesn't answer emails, doesn't come to the meetings, Ozer, you're headed south, you know. Starts at 100, but it goes all the way down to zero. We don't go negative, <laughs> the minimum is zero. But, I mean, don't let me hear that you are not responding to your group's initiative. If they're trying to communicate with you, you better respond to them. Everybody's got a cell phone that says who called. Everybody's got email. They know when a message came, okay? So if you weren't findable for the first checkpoint report, be sure you're compensating by extra participation in the second report, okay? If you weren't in the team or in the group or they just barely found you, and they wrote your name on by hand on the report because you weren't found early enough, 
that's already tipped me off that you're kind of off wandering around doing your own thing. You better get back in the fold, back with the team, and pull your share, okay? I hope everybody's hearing me. Some people are looking down like it's not important. What's your name, sir? What's, are you paying attention to what I'm saying? It looks like you're paying attention to your SMS message on your cell phone. Well, put that away, please, would you? Thank you. I'd like your eyes focused on the front, because I'm saying something real important that could make a difference in not only your grade for this course, but in your engineering career. Okay? So if you want to be an engineer, appreciate it if you'd pay attention. Okay. All right, let's go on to the lesson. Let's see what we've got for today. You can tell I'm dedicated to this. I hope that you're dedicated too. Engineers are dedicated. They're not goof-offs. They're not partly interested. They're passionate people that care to make a difference. So I hope you care. I'm trying to get you to care. I care very much. All right, we talked about uh, the Intel's evolutionary uh, evolution of its architecture. We came through this. We talked about um, the basic registers in this very complicated architecture. We talked about the addressing modes and the instruction formats. You got to say, there's not much here that resembles MIPS or ARM. Not much at all. This was from a different era. This architecture started in 1979, and the idea back then was microprocessors should be copies of mainframe computers. So the complicated architecture of mainframe computers should be put into microprocessors. That was the idea. It seemed like a great idea. We finally got enough transistors. Let's copy these big complex architectures and put them in little chips. But in, by 19, 1985, when the RISC revolution came, reduced instruction sets were the uh, uh, popular trend. And so ARM and um, uh, MIPS and many others, Spark and uh, others, uh, went that way. Okay? Now, the complex instruction set makes this a difficult one to implement. But um, compilers avoid the worst instructions. And if you've got big market share like Intel, you've got big profit, and you can spend a lot of money on amazing uh, process and circuit engineers, EEs, to make up for the lousy instruction set architecture, and you sort of come out with reasonably decent performance, okay? Um, I talked two fallacies here. One is assembly code gives you higher performance because you can write it right down at the machine level. And the problem with that is that you write more lines of code so you're more likely to make errors and be less productive. And the other problem with that is modern compilers are just as good as modern good assembly language writers. So let the compiler write the assembly code. You write in high level. We talked about optimizing compilers. We showed how they can really squeeze performance out. So writing at high level is for high performance, not writing at low level. The reason we write assembly code in this course is easy. Who can say? Why do we write an assembly code in this course? You have plenty of high-level language courses. All the rest of the courses that you'll take write in high level. Why does this course write code in low level? Yeah, we're trying to understand the machine. So let's get down close to the machine with a low-level language to help us understand the hardware. That's exactly right. The hardware-software interface is not understood very well if you're way up here in software. When you're right down here at the machine level of software, then you understand the hardware much better. And we're going to design a hardware. We're going to design a processor in our second project. Okay, <coughs> the complex instructions are really hard to implement. And there's a risk that they slow down all instructions, including the simple ones. So that's a fallacy that more powerful instructions give you higher performance. In fact, simpler instructions give you higher performance, and high-quality compilers give you higher performance. That's, those are the truths. Now, backward compatibility says the instruction set doesn't change, but that's a fallacy also. Our third fallacy uh, <coughs> is disproved by this graph. The instruction set certainly does change. Uh, this is the uh, architecture of the x86. 8086, 8186, 286, 386, 486, Pentium 1, Pentium 2, Pentium 3, Pentium 4, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The whole Intel family. And you can see that it started out with a little bit less than 100 instructions. And by 2008, got up to 900 instructions. That's not a reduced instruction set architecture. New instructions are certainly added, but no old instructions ever die out. So that's how you have backward compatibility is all the old instructions still work, but we just keep putting in more and more and more and more and more and more, of course, making a more and more complicated data path and control unit, challenging the hardware engineers in order to build the thing and make it fast. <coughs> Let's now make, wrap this whole chapter up, OK? The first thing is the stored program concept of John von Neumann. Everybody remember that? Programs are just bits, just like data. We can store them all in the same memory. We won't have a separate place for storing instructions because they're just like data. So therefore, put the ones and zeros in memory, fetch them out of memory, decode them, execute them, 
put the results where they're supposed to be and figure out what to fetch next. That's called the instruction cycle. The concept is the von Neumann architecture, or what's called the stored program architecture. Okay? And the idea is that <coughs> everything's just bits, numbers, characters, instructions, everything. So we, all, we just store it all and fetch it out of memory as we need it. So the bits themselves only have meaning as we put an interpretive scheme on that. If we say these bits are a floating point number, it means something different. If we say these bits are an instruction, it means something different. If we say these bits are an integer, it means something different still. Okay? So you, the bits are bits, but the meaning is an interpretive framework put on it out of the context. And finally, the four design principles that we saw as we worked through these slides, and which you see as you work through chapter number two, reminded over and over, four design principles for instruction set architectures are simplicity, favors regularity. If you want to keep it simple, keep it regular. If you make regular things, you'll get simple. Simple things go faster. Second one is smaller things go faster. So if you have a choice of n or n over 2, take the n over 2 if it can still meet your needs. Don't make it bigger than it has to be. Third one is make the common case fast. Do not sacrifice performance for the rare case. Instead, sacrifice the rare case in order to have performance. Make the rare case slow if you have to so that the common case is fast. Making everybody the same speed usually means slower. Okay? So what we'd rather do is separate out the frequently done things and make them fast, because that's going to give us greater average overall performance. Okay? Lastly, good design demands good compromises. Sometimes there are things that must be compromised. And if you compromise well, you make a tavis of the two competing or three competing factors, that good compromise will lead to a good design. Similarly, bad compromises end up in being bad designs. What's the deal there? The word good is an adjective, and it's talking about the sanat, the, en the engineering art of this. Good compromise, of course, requires experience and expertise and understanding and some creative freedom and, uh, yeah, kind of an aha insight. But good compromises lead to good design. Okay, now MIPS, the ISA that we've studied, uh, offers the necessary support for high-level language constructs. We've been through them all. We've seen how you do uh, procedure calls and returns. We've seen how you would do loops. We've seen how you would do uh, if-elses. We've talked about how you would do switch cases. All the structures that a high-level language needs are available in um, this low-level language. So that makes possible all the programming constructs that we need. And then the second thing that we want to mention is that spec, the, uh, <coughs> what is it? system for performance evaluation of computers or something like that uh, has benchmark programs that measure instruction execution. Okay? So <coughs> the latest spec was 2006, the integer programs and the floating point programs. When you run uh, <coughs> the, when you compile those programs into uh, MIPS and run them on the MIPS architecture, what you find out is that the arithmetic class of instructions, add, subtract, including the immediates, uh, run about 16% of the time in integer, but in floating point, they're almost half the instructions. What does that tell us about floating point programs? If I say this program uses floating point numbers, this program only uses integer numbers, what do I automatically know? The integer program probably doesn't do a whole lot of arithmetic. The floating point program is probably doing heavy amounts of calculations on those floating point numbers. Interesting. Okay. Half the instructions are adds and subtracts and immediates and multiplies and all that sort of stuff. You're working heavily on numbers when you're in this category of program. Remember that was all the quantum chromodynamics and weather modeling and you know genome computational stuff like that. All the floating point stuff was heavy science and, and uh, in engineering modeling programs. Right? Okay, the second one, the data transfer instructions, loads and stores and load bytes and all that stuff, moving things from register to memory. About a third of the time in the integer and about a third of the time in the floating point. That makes sense. You have to bring things in from uh, memory into register before you can operate on them. So therefore, about a third of the time, you're either bringing them in or bringing them out. The other two-thirds of the time, you're hopefully doing something with it. Logical instructions, ands and ors and nors and ands and immediates and all that stuff, 12% of the time here, only 4% of the time here, not using it very much here, really a small activity. These are the two major ones. Look at that. We're over 80% of the instructions just in these two categories. Get it and do arithmetic on it and put it back is the main thing you do in these kind. Okay, here's a little bit more of an even distribution. Now let's go to branches, conditional branches. 
the BEQ and the BNE along with the friends, set less than and set less than immediate in order to give us the other branches. Again, one third of the time here, tiny percentage, only 8% of the time here. And finally, the jumps. Occasionally, you have to go to somewhere further away or it's unconditional, 2%, practically 0% here, okay? So this <coughs> says occasionally go somewhere else. This hardly ever says go somewhere else. That's because there's a main thing that you've got to do. So I just wanted you to see this relationship of actual assembly language and therefore machine language instructions, not the high level instructions, but of the low level instructions, what percentage are used in this kind of program and in this kind of program. These are numeric. These are working with numbers primarily. These are not. Okay? These would be things like compilers and word processors and, and that sort of thing. Could be doing math, but not with, not with um, uh, floating point numbers. Okay, that's, our, that's the end of chapter two. Um, I'd like to ask if there's any questions that you would like to wrap it up with. We've been in chapter two now for two and a half, I think nearly three weeks. It's a major, major uh, chapter. It introduces instruction set architecture. It takes us deep into one. It surveys a couple of others. It helps us to understand how low level and high level languages are connected. About the only thing it doesn't do is show us how the machine actually implements these assembly language instructions. Don't worry, we'll get to that real soon. We'll actually build a machine that does this. But I'd like to ask her, do you have any questions about assembly language programming and the concepts that we've introduced in this chapter? Okay, great. Then project number one is going to be an outstanding success. If you don't have any questions, it means you know everything. So we're good. All right, that's great. Um, I'm going to move into chapter three then in the next set of slides unless there's any questions that would take us here in chapter two. I had an office hour today. Only one person came. Those continue to go pretty much heavily unused. So I encourage you to uh, take advantage of the teachers as they make time available for you. Um, all right, let's go on into the third chapter. Okay, now we're going to look at arithmetic for computers. We all understand arithmetic, but we understand arithmetic for humans. Last semester, we worked on trying to understand arithmetic in digital circuits. Now we're going to go even deeper and make it specific to computers. Arithmetic for computers is the point of this chapter. And we'll look at floating point numbers quite deeply here. OK, once again, bits are just bits. There's no inherent meaning. The conventions and the interpretation define how you uh, <coughs> get meaning out of this. Look at this string right here, OK? Bunch of ones and zeros. What could that mean? Wow, could mean a lot of things. If it's a base two binary integer, then it's in the range from <coughs> 0 up to maybe 2 to the n minus 1. If you only allow positive integers, if you allow it to be a negative integer, then with 2's complementation, it co goes from negative 2 is very uh, n minus 1 all the way up to positive 2 is very n minus 1 minus 1. Anyway, it gets complicated. You have finite numbers, which causes overflow. Remember me holding out my arms in CS223 and saying, what happens if you go a little bit more negative? Or what happens if you go a little bit more positive? Yeah, you have limits. These are finite. Uh, field numbers. Fractions and real numbers aren't included, of course, in integers, but we know we need those. Negative numbers, <coughs> this isn't. It can be. Uh, <coughs> even a simple example like this, there's no MIPS subtract immediate instruction because we're going to use add immediate instead with a negative number for the immediate field. So how do we represent negative numbers? Which bit patterns will we represent? Which numbers? Lots of questions. All right, I think you may remember that we have uh, covered this material pretty much in CS223, so I'll go here a little bit quickly for review. Um, we're going to have an arithmetic logic unit. This is like the one you designed on one of the labs. You can see that it takes a bus of A bits and a bus of B bits and produces a bus of result bits. It's got um, some operation code bits, four of them, and we'll call this M, and so that means there can be 16 different operations. So you can say, add this to this, subtract this to this, or these two together, uh, exclusive or these two together, um, whatever you'd like to do. Produce zero on the output, no matter what these are. Take the ones complement of this one and put it on the output. You can have lots of different operations, up to 16 different operations. These are 32-bit numbers producing a 32-bit result, but sometimes there's an overflow bit, as you know, can get to a value that cannot be represented. So we're going to let 
the rest of the world know if our result is an overflow. We're also going to let the rest of the world know if our result is zero. If all 32 of these are zero, then this is going to be set to be one so that the work's already done. So there's a little circuit here to say if this is zero. There's a little circuit here to say if this is an overflow. But basically, here's the result from these two. So we know about ALUs. Look at kind of the things that you can do with an ALU. Add, add I, add Im immediate, unsigned, add, unsigned, sub, sub, unsigned, mult, mult, unsigned, div, div, unsigned, square root, and, and immediate, nor, or. So da, 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 da. lots of things you can do using a ALU. Okay? Just take the two things. Even, even branch if equal and branch if not equal. I put two register values here, and this thing tells me if they're equal or if they're not equal. Maybe I subtract. And so the zero bit is going to tell me, are they the same? If they were, my result will be zero. That means they're equal, or they're not the same. My result is not zero. You can even use them for those. Set less than, less than immediate. It's all the, they be doing a comparison of this and this. Is this one less than this one? If so, give a value. Maybe we need to have another output. So you could do all these kind of things in an ALU. Right. We're going to have to build circuits in order to do that. Uh, we're probably going to need to sign extend some things because 16-bit immediates don't fit on a 32-bit bus. You need to sign extend them to become 32-bit immediates. So we'll sign extend some numbers. We'll also zero extend some other numbers because 16-bit logical immediates need to turn into 32-bit logical immediates in order to uh, be sent to a 32-bit ALU. And then, as we said, we'll do overflow detection on certain operations, adds and subtracts. Now, overflow, if you remember from CS223, occurs in certain conditions. Uh, it occurs when the result of an operation can't be represented in 32 bits, or n bits for an n bit um, system. So we have a 32 bit system here. If the result needs more than 32 bits, you've had an overflow. If it cannot be represented in the finite field uh, that we've got, then you have an overflow. And that can be indicated, or is indicated to us, when the sign bit contains a value bit of the result. Instead of just being the sign, the value got too big and the sign bit ended up containing value and not the proper sign. Okay? So you get a wrong sign on these overflows, if you remember correctly. So when adding operands with different signs or when subtracting operands with the same sign, you can never get an overflow. So you can see here that when I add A and B, and this one's non-negative and this one's non-negative, I can get an overflow if they're both too big, and it'll, sh it'll show up as a negative number. So add two positives and get a negative. You've got an overflow. Or add two negatives and get a positive. You've got an overflow. That's a clear indication that the value came into the sign bit and, and bows it up. Or subtract two, where one's positive and one's negative, and get a negative result. Or subtract two of them, where one's negative and one's positive, and get a positive result. Those are cases where you have an overflow. And MIPS signals that you have an overflow with an exception. In other words, it causes an interrupt. An interrupt is an unscheduled um, procedure call to the operating system. It says, my user code has done something weird, Yaramaz, or unexplainable. Please save me, oh great operating system. All right, so the user code stops, and the operating system says, whoa, whoa, Heidi Klar, Bidaka, Bickley. Now let's get this mess straightened out. So the operating system comes in and runs code to try to fix the mess that caused the uh, exception. The exception in this case is an overflow exception. We have a special register called the exception program counter, which is going to contain the address of the instruction that caused the overflow. And that's the clue to the operating system when it's going to try to figure this out as to who was the Aramaz. Who was the Aramaz boy or Aramaz girl? Who caused this overflow? Okay. Now, here's how you might implement an ALU. <coughs> if you notice, uh, what we've got here is A0 and B0 being anded, ORed, exclusive ORed, and NORed, and added or subtracted together. Don't forget, adding can be also turned into subtraction very easily um, with this exclusive OR gate. And A1 and B1 the same, and dot, 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 all the way to A31 and A B31 the same. And all those result bits <coughs> right here are the 32 result bits coming out of the ALU. So here's 32 A bits, 32 B bits, and 32 result bits. Now, if you want to generate zero and overflow, you just take all those result bits and nor them together. If all those happen to be zero, then that's going to give you a one. And you, you have, therefore, a zero output value. Similarly, the uh, carry out from uh, this and this are anded together to form overflow. So that's how MIPS implements the um, ALU. Notice the um, 
overflow bit is only enabled for signed arithmetic, add, subtract, and add immediate. Now, what about performance? Because that had a chained carry, as you can see, the carry from here goes to here, the carry from here goes to here. We have a ripple carry. We know that's not going to be very good performance. We studied this also in CS223. Ripple carry for addition and subtraction is going to be slow. So the critical path of an n-bit ripple carry adder, as you can see, is going to be n multiplied by the carry propagation. For each of these one-bit ALUs, there's a thing called carry propagation. It's a two-gate delay. And that two-gate delay is going to be multiplied by the number of stages. In our case, n is 32. So it's going to be 32 times whatever the carry propagation delay is. Now, you can do a design trick, and you can compute all the carries in parallel. And that kind of adder is called a carry look-ahead adder. And it uses a carry look-ahead unit. And if you're interested in that, you can look back in CS223 and, and learn more. OK, now for multiplication, a binary multiplication is just a bunch of shifts to the right and additions together. I mean, think about how we do multiplication by hand. You say, this times this, put it here. This times this, put it here. This times this, put it here. And then for this one, you say, oh, well, start, shift it over one. This times this goes here. Not here, but here, because it's in the second place. This times this, so on. So this multiplied by that is this partial product. This multiplied by that is this partial product. And of course, all these are just ones and zeros. So when I say this times this, the only possibilities are 0 or 1. There's never any carry to the next bit. So I write a bunch of zeros and 1s, and now it's time to add up those partial products. Okay? And it can be formed in parallel and added in parallel for faster multiplication. I have n partial products. The number of bits that I get is 2 times n. When this is n, then the number of bits in the result can be as great as 2n, called a double precision product. You can make some hardware that would do that for you. Okay, and if you look here, um, <coughs> we've got a 64-bit register to hold the multiplicand. It's going to actually just take 32 bits and then shift to the left. You've got a 64-bit ALU to add those 64 bits with the product bits, because of course what I'm doing is calculating partial products and then adding them to the previous sum. Everybody see that this makes the next partial product, uh, in, and then I add it together to this one. Partial products are going to be really easy to calculate. If this is a 0, then 0 times this gives me zeros here. If this is a 1, then 1 times this gives me whatever this is here. So my partial products are either copies of the multiplicand if the multiplier bit is 1, or they are 0 if the multiplier bit is 0. So I'm simply adding values of the multiplicand to itself, but shifted. And as you can see, that if this was 1, 1, 1, 1, then this would be multiplicand, 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 but I've got a shift. And so that's why, in my hardware here, I've got the multiplicand, and I can shift it and add it to the sum of the partial products, which is accumulated here. Initially, that product is 0. As I add in things, it accumulates and gets larger. Now, I have a control here, which tests and evaluates whether <coughs> that to add or not, whether to shift or not, when to write, and so forth, when to shift right here. It takes this multiplier and looks at the 32 bits and says, is the bit I'm working with right now 0 or 1? And based on that, it controls this. So here's the algorithm. That's the hardware. The algorithm says, test the multiplier bit 0. Is it equal to 0? Then you don't do anything. You come here. Is it equal to 1? You do do something. You add the multiplicand to that uh, product and place the result in the product register. And then you come here. Now you shift the multiplicand register left 1 instead of shifting things to the right, namely the multiplier. Sorry, multiplicand. Sorry. Eh, hold on, go back here. Make sure I can say it right. It looks like here we're shifting to the left, but we could do the same thing by shifting the multiplicand to the right. In other words, instead of having partial products be shifted left, we could shift the multiplicand to the right and accomplish the same thing. So that's what it's doing. Shift the multiplicand register, sorry, to the left one bit, then shift the multiplier register to the right one bit, and then add, have we done it 32 times? No, go back and do it again. Yes, we have, so we're done. So that's the algorithm for simple multiplication. Now, it's not very optimum. We could do things uh, faster. We could perform the add shift step in parallel. We could also shrink down the size of the registers. So look here. Now we have a 32-bit register here, a 32-bit ALU, much, big, much smaller, big savings here as well. Our product register is going to be 64 because we know that we get 2n for the result. So we start out, with, as you can see here, with the uh, multiplier here. 
and we're going to be shifting to the right and losing it. The multiplier <coughs> and multiplicand will be, is that right? Yeah, I think that's right. No, 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 I'm sorry. It's here, and, um, and we, we're able to test the bit and see if it's a zero or one and decide to write the result. The 32-bit the result we'll, we'll write is here, um, and then we'll shift the whole thing uh, to the right this way. So uh, each time we shift it this way, we move it down. In the end, the initial multiplier is shifted out, and the initial multipli uh, product that we came in is all the way shifted down here, plus lots more. So in the end, the full 64 bits are filled with the product. Is there any question about the architecture of this? So we're starting with our multiplier here. We're testing the least significant bit, and that tells me if I need to uh, add or not. Uh, we're adding the multiplicand uh, to shifted versions of the partial product here and here to form the new sum of partial products. Okay, so the sum of partial products is being accumulated. If we go back to we start with this, then we have the sum of these, then we have the sum of these, then we have, you know, we're adding one each time, as you can see. And the old ones need to decrease in significance by shifting to the right, and that's exactly what they do. They decrease in significance by shifting to the right. The new ones come in at the most significant end, the older ones are less significant, so they shift to the right. Okay, so this is computer hardware to do multiplication using the add and shift approach. Now, notice that it's one cycle per partial product. If you have 32 bits, you have 32 partial products, it's going to take 32 cycles. And if you don't multiply very often, then you have a slow multiplier. It doesn't hurt you too bad. But if you multiply often, a 32 cycle multiplication is going to be very, very slow. So are there some ways to speed it up? Sure. How many 32-bit ALUs did this use? One. How many times did it use it? 32 times. How about we instead have 32 ALUs and only use them each once. Ah, okay. This is going to be much faster, but obviously 32 times more in cost. Okay, I have now 32 of these in a tree, which would have 16 on the top row, actually 31. 16 on the top row, 8 on the next row, 4 on the next row, 2 on the next row, and 1 on the final row. So I have a grand total of 31 of these. I think everybody can see that what's going to happen is data is going to flow. If it's most significant, it finishes early. If it's least significant, it finishes early. It's the middle bits that finish last. Okay, So we end up having how many levels of delay here? One, two, three, four, five levels of delay through these things. So it's going to be much faster. Instead of 32 clock cycles or 31 clock cycles, it's five levels of combinational delay. Is this a fast, small combinational delay? Not exactly, but it can be made fast. We know how to speed these up, right? make these faster. Okay. So if this is a ripple carry, it'll be slow. If this is a carry look ahead, it'll be fast. And we need to have 31 of these in a tree architecture. A lot of hardware, a lot of parallelism. Why? Speed, speed, performance, performance, performance. Okay. So what we're doing is spending our transistors in order to get a better result in the hardware. So this is fast multiply. This is slow multiply. This is cheap multiply. This is expensive multiply. Space-time trade-off, once again, space-time trade-off. Okay. Any questions about multiplication? All right. So now let's go to MIPS. MIPS has got some assembly language instructions. We first talked about implementing them. Now let's talk about what they would look like. There's a MULT instruction in MIPS, which takes two operands, each of which is a register, 32 bits. It's going to produce the product of those. And so the product of those is going to be a 64-bit result. It's going to go in the high and low registers. The high register holds the upper 32 bits of the result. The low register holds the lower 32 bits of the result. Grand total, 64 bits result. Okay. There's also a MULT unsigned. And this does unsigned multiplication of these two and also puts it in the high and low register. Okay. Now, after the results are in the high and low register, you've got to get the pieces out. So that means you need to have a move from high and a move from low instruction to put them in some other register that you want to put them in. So this automatically uses the multiplication hardware and puts the 64-bit product there. So does this one. And then to get it out, you get it out piece by piece. First move the high, then move the low. In this case, obviously, you need a different register or it'll destroy. Okay, so this moves the high into T0, the low into T0. Now there's a pseudo instruction which says, please multiply these two and put the result here. Now this is only 32 bits. So what does that mean? It means that this should not exceed 32 bits in its product or else you're going to lose some bits. And what does it do? 
Well, it's clear. It multiplies these and then does move from low and puts it here. So it does this and this together in one instruction. It's the mull. It's a pseudo. It's not a real hardware instruction, but it gets the job done. In the end, the T0 will contain the lower 32 bits of your product. Hopefully, there is no upper 32 bits that you lost because they're gone. Okay? So mull gives you, for small multiplications, gives you the result. Now, dividing. Let's talk about hardware for dividing. Longhand division, most of us have done this kind of work before, not maybe in base two, but certainly most of us have. Raise your hand if you did division like this at some point in your school career so you know how to do division. No? You only know how to punch numbers on a machine? You don't know how to divide by hand? You must. Did your teachers ever teach you how to say, look, this is the uh, divisor, this is the dividend, let's guess the first digit of our uh, final quotient, we multiply this times this, we partial product, try to subtract it, if it's negative then no and so on. Did you never do that? Yes, basamak, basamak? Using, using what? Different style. Different style, yeah, but you did this method. I mean, you, you guessing basamak, basamak, finding what will subtract out with a positive remainder and working your way over to here. In the end, this is your quotient and this is your remainder when you're all done with this. It's a hand division approach. If you've not done this, then you're not going to understand what I have to say. If you just only push buttons on a machine all your career, you don't understand how division actually works, I'm sorry. You, you're exic. I mean, you, you should have been taught how to do hand division, and you should still remember. Anyway, so this is what we're doing longhand, and it takes n plus 1 steps, okay? So for 4-bit, four 4-bit, four this takes 5 steps, and we end up with the remainder. Now, if that's how we do it by hand, what do you think we're going to do by computer? Hello? By hand? By computer, right? Yeah, we copy. The first thing we do is we copy what we do by hand, even if it takes n steps or n plus 1 steps. Then we look for opportunities to speed it up, as we did here, too. That's OK. That's much better. Speed it up, right? Okay. One long clock cycle, or maybe two or three clock cycles instead of 32. So same idea here is we'll start by dividing. So the first solution says <coughs> subtract the divisor from the rem uh, remainder and give us, you actually put the initial thing in the remainder. So the, the initial uh, dividend, I think it's called, is put in the remainder. And then, of course, we're going to subtract, subtract, subtract. So whatever's left at the end is the real remainder. But in the beginning, it starts there. So take away the <coughs> divisor from it and test and see if you got a negative number or a positive number. Oops, the slide is messed up. But obviously what happens is you either go here or you go here. In the case of a negative remainder, oops, it was too big, what do you do? You restore the remainder. You put back what you subtracted out and then you shift the quotient left. Okay? On the other hand, if when you subtracted you still got a positive number left, great, then that was a good guess. Don't forget our guesses can only be one or zero. Right? In base 10 our guesses can be 9876543210. But here our guesses can only be 1 or 0. So we guess 1 and subtract it out. If we're wrong, then we're going to come over to here. We know it should be a 0. And so the <coughs> we um, shift the quotient left and put in a 0. Here we shift the quotient left and we set the bit to be 1. Here we shift the quotient left and set the bit to be 0. Then we come back together and we say, great, no matter whether uh, our guess was wrong or right, we fixed it now. If it was a zero, we fixed it here and added back. If it was a one, we were correct. Now we shift the divisor to the right, and we say, have I done it 33 times? If no, come back and do it again. If yes, you're done. And done means what's left in the remainder is the final value. Now let's look at this. Subtract. One, that's good. This time try a one, no, put it back, make it a zero. Subtract zero. This time put a 1, no, didn't work, subtract, put it back, give it a 0, take out 0. For this one, a 1. Have we done it enough times? Yes. Done. That's our remainder. That's our quotient. That's how it works. We're doing the same thing iteratively in hardware. Okay, now the hardware to do that would look something like this. Again, starting with the initial value in the remainder here. From that, we're going to be subtracting out the divisor, telling our 64-bit ALU to please do a subtraction for us. Uh, and then testing the remainder. If the most significant bit of it is zero, that means we're good. If it's one, it means we turned it into a negative number. The control might cause us to have to add it back, okay? 
um, the quotient bit, one by one, is being accumulated here as we write in ones or zeros and shift it to the left. So this figures out if it should be a one or a zero and puts in the one or zero and moves it across. So the first one we put in will eventually be our most significant quotient bit, just like here. The first thing we figure out is our most significant quotient bit. Then we figure this, then this, then this. Okay, so that's how that works. Now, the problem with that is it's, it's really not very efficient. Just like the multiplication hardware, we can speed it up. We can make it much more efficient. And so uh, half of the 64-bit adder is therefore wasted. Either the high or the low bits are all zero. And so therefore, your half of the divisor bits are zero. You're wasting it. You do not really need a 64-bit ALU. You really do not need a 64-bit divisor. So therefore, what we're going to do is change it. We'll have a 32-bit ALU and a 32-bit divisor. We'll start with our remainder here in this position. And we will send it up here for 32-bit subtraction. And we'll eventually, as we shift this thing left, it'll move across like this. And we'll test the bit just like we did before with control. And we'll write in ones and zeros here and shift those across. Eventually, we'll have a 32-bit quotient here. And a 32-bit remainder will be here. And that's our, that's our new hardware for number two. Then the third one, just notice there's a small efficiency that can happen on that. This, I'll let you look at this in the textbook. It's an improved algorithm even on number two called solution number three. Um, and you notice that it only does 32 iterations instead of 33. We save one there. If you notice in the um, uh, loop, we're doing the subtraction and then test and we either uh, set the bit to be one or we restore and set the bit to be zero. And then down here at the end, there's a post-processing after you're done, uh, we need to shift left the remainder. Um, okay, so the hardware for that looks like this. And again, it got a little bit smaller still. Look what, where are we writing our result? Remember before we had a quotient register here? Now that's gone. So where's our result going? As we calculate our result in the control unit, where am I writing the ones and zeros of my quotient? Yeah, I'm sticking them right in here, and they're moving across like this. Okay, so what happened? Initially, my... Uh, 64 bits that I'm dividing into started here, okay, and my divisor is here, and then what I'm doing is I'm shifting this across. My result quotient is going in here as I shift this. So when I move it this way and make a new space, that's where the new bit goes in. In the end, there's my quotient, there's my remainder, and my divisor stays the same. And my initial dividend, which was here, is gone completely. My initial dividend of 64 bits is now reduced to whatever the remainder was in this part. And my quotient will be here because I'm putting in the quotient bits one by one. In other words, instead of having two different registers, look here, both of which write in and shift left, I just put this here. So I don't need to have this extra register anymore. So I saved hardware and saved a step on iteration as well. Okay, so dividing in MIPS, let's see how that works. We have a div instruction. S0, S1, the division between them ends up in the high-low register, where the high is the quotient and the low is the remainder, or an unsigned division. Again, it ends up in the high-low register. <coughs> Once you're in the high-low register, you've got to move them out. So move from high, moves out your quotient, move from low, moves out your remainder. There's some pseudo instructions which speed this up. If you div S0, S1, you divide them and put the quotient, I'm uh, sorry, div, uh, what's it called? Yeah, quotient in T0. If you rem them, you divide them and put the remainder in T0. Is that clear? So this is the division of those two. The, divide, the um, quotient goes here. This is the modulus or remainder function. The remainder will go here. Because, of course, they both exist. In the, in the high register is the quotient. The low register is the remainder when we're done. If you go back the quotient's here, the remainder's here. Other way around, the remainder's in the high and the quotient's in the low. Sorry, I goofed that up. So you have them both. So you can therefore transfer them out and even make pseudo instructions, which get the quotient in this one and get the remainder on this one. Okay. All right, we'll do floating point numbers after the break. Take a 10 minute break and come back and we'll work on floating point arithmetic. <coughs>